Great. Here we go. There we go. That better. So I've got um, 10.59 lead. Do you want me to wait just another minute or just start admitting people and then you can just start whenever you're ready? I think we can go ahead and start admitting people. All right, I'm going to mute, but if you need anything, just chat or say anything. Uh, we'll yeah. be Thank you, Pat. Okay, and you're all three co-hosts, so you all should be able to share. Great, great. Thank you. And when it gets to the point of sh of needing to screen share those those um, documents, I, I'll be able to do that. Okay, you okay. start. You have trouble text me, and then I'll I'll jump in. Yep. Yeah. Here's April. Yay. Annie. Yay. Hi. And Trish. Yay. <laughs> It's nice when people come to your party, isn't it? It is. <laughs> we threw a party and our best friends are here. Right. <laughs> this is so fun. There's Laurie. Mm -hmm. We should have some music playing. I'm sure somebody in this chat, in this Zoom has a banjo or guitar, like, yep, yep, it's Dan, it's Dan. <laughs> fiddle, we got except, double fiddles. Except none of Let's you have it. Let's mics. Do it. And there's a reason for that. <laughs> well, we're gonna, wait a few minutes and let some people pile in before we get started. I got yeah. unmuted. Oh. Ooh. I'm supposed to be able to do that. Now mute yourself. Okay, Daniel, try again. Hey. Oh, oh. There we go. Nice. <laughs> Sorry, oh, Dan. Man, you just you. muted the you just muted the fiddle kick. <laughs> I have a fiddle kick to the thing. That's messed up. <laughs> Yikes. All right. Well, how is everybody this morning? Is it morning? No, it's noon. It's morning where I am. It's, it's noon, which for all musicians is still morning. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> Well, we have set this up so that you can choose whatever view you want to. If you want to have speaker view or gallery view, that's that's in your control. Um, I think it's a couple minutes after, and I think maybe we will we will go ahead and uh, and get started. Um, welcome to our first of the virtual workshops of this this um, season, this winter. Um, this is these virtual workshops are. Um, presented by the Leadership Bluegrass alumni. I'm Lee Stivers, co-chair. Michelle Gourley is the other co-chair. I don't see her on here yet. She's probably working. Um, and also um, sponsored by the Education Committee of IBMA. So, um, so these are now open to everyone, not just Leadership Bluegrass alumni, but also uh, all of membership, which is kind of cool. Um, we are, our topic today is working on a building, laying the foundation for your musical legacy. Uh, and this workshop was put together by our legacy work group. Uh, Katie Hogue is, are you the official chair of that unofficial group? Maybe Katie or, or she's okay. the lead, lead dog. I think it's one of those deals where whoever comes up with the idea is stuck leading it. And, but right. we have a fabulous group of all leaders with Daniel and Mary Beth, who's joining us, and Laurie's um, uh, part of the group, um, Greg Reich, uh, Carly and Deb at the Hall of Fame, Anna at IBMA, um, CJ Lewandowski. I know I've missed some. April Virch, oh my gosh, April Virch, who is like one of the massively most important um, people here. And so, um, yeah, no, we've got a great group of people that's been working on how to go about preserving legacies in bluegrass music and beyond. 
Fantastic. And this, um, this presentation actually is a follow up on the presentation that Daniel Ruth, who was our, our main speaker today, gave at the Leadership Bluegrass Alumni Masterclass at World of Bluegrass just a couple uh, short months ago. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think other than a couple housekeeping things, at the moment, you're, you don't have mics. We want to see how many people show up to the group. Um, uh, so put your questions in the chat. Katie's going to ride herd over uh, over that discussion. If if uh, we'll see as we go along, if it's a smaller group, then we may uh, you know give you all mics and let folks talk. But otherwise, we will keep it this way. And I guess I will just turn it over now to to Daniel Ruth, and I'll let you maybe give a little introduction of who you are and what you do, Daniel. Okay. Well, um, I want to thank everybody for attending. And give me one moment because my iPad just died with my outline on it. <laughs> um, now, um, what do I do? Gosh, a little bit of everything um, out here in the studio, as you can see behind me today, doing some work. Um, uh, I guess my main gig is I perform with the band New Blue. Um, and then uh, we also host the television show Bluegrass Ridge. Um, which we just made a big announcement post IBMA. Um, in addition to being in 120 million homes across the country on seven networks, we now expanded to 85 affiliates. Uh, that's local affiliates. So we're getting getting bluegrass out there every week, which is the purpose of this. We got a, a rising tide floats all boats and we're trying to put as much bluegrass music out there as we can. Um, I also work with Turnberry Records. Uh, I am the vice president of distribution for the record label I handle, getting all the music for the artists out there and play a small part in the marketing of that um, as it pertains to distribution. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> so there, there's that and then there all the uh, wonderful things that go into all that. So, but thanks for having me. Um, for everyone that uh, was at the master class, this is going to kind of be a recap of that. Um, there's some a few things that since then, we, uh, we had some questions that were asked at IBMA. And um, we wanted to kind of uh, expand on it a little bit. And then uh, Katie and I have been um, back and forth on some things with um, especially involving her background with um, her dad's estate. And, and so we have um, have some folks here that have been directly through some of the stuff we're going to be covering. Um, but I want to jump right into it and just kind of cover my outline and get to as many questions as we can um, on this. Um, you know, we, we called this segment working on a building um, because as the work group was starting to pull everything together, um, someone said one day that, um, you know, well, you got to have a foundation, you know, before you can build a house or anything for that matter. So we, um, you know, the, the core foundation of everything, uh, when you start talking about legacy and moving everything forward, you know, the core foundation of everything is, is you, you know, you, you got to have something before you can do something with it. And I think that that's where a lot of artists, um, they don't do step one correctly. And step one is what is defining your legacy? You know, you, we, we define that in several ways. You know, it's, it's what the public defines it as, is part of it. But, you know, for an artist themselves, they need to define their legacy. And step one of that is pulling items together. Um, so we're going to cover uh, three things today. We're going to talk about... Um, what things can go into defining your legacy, um, how to correctly assign value to that. And then most importantly, um, we're gonna get into a little bit of the why you should do both of those, um, both um, while you're still alive and as you, you know, pass on. So um, step one, uh, we wanna talk about the things that you should be pulling together. Um, you know, All right, I think we have lost Daniel for just a moment. He's pretty tech savvy, so he will find his way back here. But until he gets here, I have the outline in front of me. I'm going to pinch hit for him. 
So he's talking about pulling things together. Um, step one is just kind of getting your ducks in a row. And it starts with making a defined list of your property. And property can be both physical and intellectual. Um, we all know intellectual property is going to be like your songs, your um, copyrights, your publishing, your body of work, digital assets, things like that. And then your physical property is, you know, obviously going to refer to things like instruments, album masters, maybe it's clothing, daily items, memorabilia, you know, and this is not just for artists and musicians. This is for anybody who works in the industry. You know, it may be microphones, amplifiers, recording equipment anything like that. Um, so, and what we're going to do later at the end of this virtual workshop is we are going to give you the tools, um, worksheets and the tools to help you do that. Okay, so there is Daniel. Daniel, I made a quick run through step, part one of step one. So I'm going to toss it back over to you. Let me, um, let me do something here, everybody. Let me come in on a different link on my cell phone. For some reason, my internet's blinking in and out. I don't know if they're working on something in town. Let me just come in on my cell phone. I'm using my cell signal that way. So okay, I'm going to talk about, about the worksheets for just a second while you're That'll doing That'll be fine. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the worksheets, and we've got nine different worksheets. Obviously, there are more that can be created, but we've got nine different worksheets that we're going to put in the chat. And they're also, we can email them to you that you can print out today, if you want to, three hole punch them, stick, in a, stick them in a binder and start um, collecting this information for your legacy. And we will um, get the, anything on agreements and contracts, album and song masters, um, assets, instruments, publishing, all of that. So we're gonna help you pull that stuff together. Are you ready, Daniel? I see you in uh... the area. You need um, one of you off. Let me, uh, yep, yeah, get in there. Let me leave that <laughs> one. Sorry, everybody. All right. What a, what a, I don't know why that did that. So I just quickly covered that first part of step one. So you can go on to sure. two and then we'll come Thank back. You. Thank you. I'm switching my outline over to my uh, computer real quick. Okay. All right. So we got step one. Okay. So everybody saw the, the sheets. Um, st the second part of um, the property that you own is uh, intellectual property. And I think that this is one of the areas that especially artists, um, sometimes we don't do a good job collecting things. You know, it's not, it's not the guitar that's laying right in front of you. So you don't really think about the value of intellectual property. And that can be um, any digital assets, um, audio and video, that can be um, song masters, uh, song copyrights, um, uh, publishing, and there is a difference in that. Um, I wanna make sure that we define the fact that you can uh, write a song and you can own the copyright on a song, but you may, not, may or may not own a part of the publishing. Um, so there's differentiation there. Um, but songwriting copyrights, um, and it's very important to list out what percentages of that that you own. Um, you know, a lot of times you co-write with somebody, you may own 50%, 70%, whatever. Um, same thing with publishing. Um, make sure that you list your percentage of ownership with publishing. Um, and then, you know, it comes down to, as you start to pull together these songs and this publishing, it comes down to your total body of work. You know, there, there's an intellectual property value to your total body of work. And I think a lot of artists miss that. When I was starting to put everything together for this legacy work group and started talking to different lawyers about different things, I think this is one of the things, Katie and I were just chatting earlier this morning, this is one of the biggest things that kind of stood out to me. And it's like, wow, I should have thought about that before but I never really thought about the total body of work that we have with songwriting and things like that, having such potentially a, a larger value to it. Um, and that's going to come in in the why in a few minutes and you'll understand why having that value on that's more important. Um, so um, that's kind of, you know, where to start there is get a defined list of all this property. Use these worksheets. Uh, Katie has got, 
great worksheets. You know, print those out, put them on your computer, whatever's easy for you, but start making those defined lists. Um, the second part uh, of step one is make sure that you secure any ownership of any of this stuff. If it's masters, define the ownership and make sure you're the owner. As um, you know, sometimes depending on contracts, certain recording contracts, you know, the record label may own the master for 25 years and then it comes back to you. So, you know, if it's that situation, know that that's going to happen. Know when that 25 year mark is be in contact with the record label on the front side of that and say, Hey, uh, I get my master back here. Where is it? You know, where's the master tape? Make sure that you have all that stuff, you know, um, you know, make sure that you, you're aware of all that. Um, the, um, the other side of ownership is, um, any copyright that you do with a PRO, which is a performing rights organization, um, that would be uh, BMI, ASCAP, CSAC. Um, Everything is going to be listed there. Any type of uh, legacy preservation as far as passing that along to anybody else, um, that's going to be as simple as going in and making a change at the PRO to um, – where that gets paid out to so there's not a lot of um there's not a whole lot of red tape in that but referring back to what we we're talking about earlier if you don't have a list you may leave something out so a really good complete list of everything is crucial um and then um you know i talked about copyrights already publishing and split outs and all that um you know, make sure that you're you're just good on all that. Make sure that you know what percentage of ownership is listed very very clearly on the worksheets. Um, and I think the third thing is one of the most important things. And I think this is this is a big part of what gets left out, and that's why we included it on the worksheets. And that's where is it? <laughs> a lot of times, people will, you know, um, people will. Um, have something or you'll have this great list of everything and you go, wow, you know what? I've got, um, I've got a, a, a mandolin I own and I've got these show posters over here. Um, and I've got, you know, all this stuff. And there was this pick, you know, uh, in the master class, I had this pick that was used by Bill Monroe. And where, well, it doesn't do me any good if I don't know where it's at. Um, and if it's not stored properly and protected and things like that. So, you know, number one, list where you've got it. You know, if it's if it's a physical thing, um, I said, correct storage, make sure everything's stored right. You know, um, you know use humidity packs and instruments, make sure they don't get damaged because there, there's the value going on there. Um, safety deposit boxes are good um, for me, for masters. Um, <clears throat> I always have uh, three copies of masters back when it was actual copies that you needed and then now if it's a file then i make sure that i've got that file on three different um flash drives and in three different locations um you know i always i keep a uh, i keep a copy in the house in a safe in the studio in a safe and then in a safety deposit box that way there's always there you know you, you can never lose that match you have a fire unfortunately you know, if that were to happen um or a flood um i, I my entire studio flooded one time four feet of water um so you know that i lost a lot in that um so i've learned the hard way to back stuff up and redo and make multiple copies um so um so that kind of gets us through step number step number one or the first part of this is you know define what you have um know where it's at make sure you own it that's kind of the three takeaways there um the next thing we want to talk about and i i'll kind of use this next segment um we're going to talk about value here on the next segment and something keeps popping up on my phone i don't know why the internet is not my friend today folks so um Can everybody still hear me? Yes. Okay. 
happened. All right, good deal. Just checking. Okay, so the next step that we're going to talk about, the next thing is going to be value. And <clears throat> this is where it starts getting a little bit, um, starts getting a little bit tricky because when you say defining value to something, there's different ways that you would want it, that you might want to assign value to something for different reasons. Um, and then at the same time, there are items that an artist may not think have any major monetary value to someone, but to a collector or to a fan, a regular everyday item could be something that somebody would, that it would pay a lot of money for to have. Um, you know, I go back to the example of Bill Monroe's toaster that I think sold for like, what, 300 bucks at auction or something like that. I'm like, he used it to make toast. He never thought about that, but <clears throat> it's a thing, you know? Um, so um, let me speak to that first. So think about different items as you, as you pull, you know, your, your, your um, physical property together, you start thinking about that, you know, look around the house and think about things, um, you know, memorabilia, show posters, uh, backstage passes, ticket stubs, anything like old set lists, anything like that that may not be that valuable to us as an artist could potentially be valuable to someone else and could be a situation where later in life where you need some income where that you can assign that value and one of the things that we want to make sure we point out to everybody is how to increase that value um you know if i say oh i have a set list that was written out um by Bill Monroe, um, that's great. It may or may not have been if he signed it, that would help all, uh, add authenticity to it. Um, but, you know, I, in the master class, they used an example. I had a pick and I said, Oh, this is a pick. And then I told everybody, Well, it's a pick that was used by Bill Monroe to record Rawhide. And then it was like, Whoa. And then I had a certificate of authenticity stating that. And in, in these days where we can throw our cell phone up and get a video, if you can have a video showing you with that item, you can build in these levels of authenticity and it makes that item worth a whole lot more money. So that's something that I think as an artist sometimes that we don't really think about because it's like, gosh, nobody would want my toaster ever. But maybe they would. So, you know, sometimes it's good just to think about different items like that and how to build in added value to those items. Um, so that's a that's a way that you can do that. You know, certificates of authenticity, video signatures on the item, of course, is a great way to do that. Um, so let's talk about this this value. Um, <clears throat> there are three areas of value that we want to cover. Um, the first is, you know, sometimes, you know, if you have to part with an item or if you're in a situation where you are going to uh, gift the item to maybe um, a museum or organization where it's a tax write-off situation, you want to make sure that, you know, you're getting the max value for your item. So that's a situation where you're searching the, um, you may be searching out someone to give you a higher value. So situations like that, we're looking for a higher value in an item. Um, I think everybody, it's pretty safe to say that when, if it comes to a uh, tax situation, um, a lot of times you're trying to get the lowest value <laughs> on that item that you can so you don't have to pay as many taxes on it um so when we talk about value there's both sides of that you know there's sometimes you're trying to get the high value for something sometimes you're trying to get the low value um and that's just that's that depends on the circumstance so um everybody's encountered that situation in their life at some point um the third instance of value that we're talking about and that's specifically going to relate to the why of this whole segment is uh, what's called real world value and that is if you are in a situation where you've passed on and it's it's a state 
and they're looking at value in the estate, um, they're going to look at real world value. And that's what it's worth at that current time. Um, Katie and I were having a discussion about songs and, and about, you know, how value can, a song that may have been written and done real well, then come down and all of a sudden it's used in a movie and it goes way up and that movie is now 10 years old. And so now it's, it's back down. So that, that's all moving targets. Um, so it's real world value is kind of where it's at, at that moment in time is a great way to look at real world value um, and to understand we want everybody to understand that <clears throat> real world value is um it moves it's not like it's set today and it does it it, it, it can change but it's at that moment in time when you're dealing with an estate or something that's that's where real world about real world value comes in at um <clears throat> now that that seg gives us a great segue into the first part of the why of all this. Um, you know, my part of this legacy uh, work group is um, to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of the money part of this. Um, you know, there's there's a thousand reasons to preserve legacy um but you know as as an artist uh, or anybody doing whatever you do in the music industry you know you also want to preserve this stuff so that you know work you want to preserve your legacy so that it can provide you potentially income down the road and or something of value to pass along to family members to pass along to museums different things like that um so, you know, I've called this on my outline. It's, it's, it's kind of the post-performance world, you know, whenever you've got to that point of you're not continuing to perform. And, you know, I, I don't think any artist ever stops performing because they want to. Uh, I think they get to a point where they have to. And then that's, you know, if you're preparing all this stuff now, when you get to that point where we don't even want to talk about it, but it's, it's inevitable when you get to that point where you have to, that's where a lot of this stuff's really going to kick in <clears throat> and it's really going to save you a lot of time and a lot of heartache um, because trying to pull it all together then you forgot where things are you know it, it goes back to how valuable step one and step two are um, and we don't want everybody uh, to back up just a second on value we don't want everyone to get wrapped up in that value column we want to make sure that you're aware of what it is and what it's for and that it is important um, because you, you never know. I mean, accidents happen, tragedies happen. And if you have value assigned to things already, that's going to help whoever's the next person that's having to handle that, <clears throat> having to handle that. So that column's important, but we don't want everybody to get caught up in that column um so post-performance world there's really two instances that i focused on here there, there's some other things too but the two main instances that i focused on here were um your post-performance but now you're in a situation where you're still alive but you need help you know you need med you need medical help maybe it's a situation where you've got to go into a uh, full-time care facility um, and I've had firsthand experience with this over the last 18 months to two years with Carolyn's mother. Um, so we thought she was in a, she was in a situation where we thought she was going to have to go into an extended care facility for the rest of her life. And thankfully things turned around and she's back home now. Um, but in preparation for all that, we suddenly had to start looking at the um, the Medicare look backs and everything, you know, where they start. And I was like, what's a look back? Well, I don't, I don't, why, why does that matter? And they're like, well, it determines how much assistance you're going to get and whether or not you're going to have to sell off everything you own before insurance kicks in. And I'm like, oh, well, that's that's probably a pretty important thing to look at. And then as we went through all that with her mom, 
and at the simultaneously started doing things with the legacy work group, I was like, wow, this could be very important. Um, and so that's where we start to value. It starts to become very important. Um, I do want to put out there, I should have put it out at the very beginning, Katie. I forgot. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but um, we have consulted, I have consulted lawyers with this, with this information. Um, but nothing that's on here is considered uh, direct legal advice. We are taking ideas, we're putting things together, we're putting worksheets together, basically as tools for you to use and go back. Um, every state has different laws on um, Medicare, <clears throat> the look back and on estate planning. So, um, we want to put out there that this is in no means direct legal advice, and we're going to encourage everyone to make sure that you get with um, a good estate planning attorney um, to look at any of this stuff as it applies to you per your individual state. Um, so I want to make sure we put that out there before we dive into this next part. Um, so. Um, some of the things that you want to do so you don't what you want to do is you don't want to get in a situation with this look back because they look back five years and anything this is and we're going to first thing we're going to cover is gifting because this is one of the things that really surprised me the most um <clears throat> they're going to look back five years and they're going to see they're going to do an, an overall look at your whole financial catalog if you've got to go you know full-time and they're going to look at everything that you've done they're going to look at everything you have as value which includes your body of work. And, you know, that's a situation where, you know, it would be like, gosh, I've wrote 300 songs in my life. And wouldn't it be horrible if those 300 songs kept me from being able to get the, the, the help that I needed because I didn't have everything catalog right or it surprised me. Because if you have it done right and you take it to the right attorney, they can do things to make it where Medicare won't look at certain parts of things. Um, the other thing is gifting anything that you give away if you give away money to your kids if you give away your music catalog to your kids if you give away an instrument to your kids to a museum to anything if it has real world value it that means if it could be sold for something and you gift that to someone you give it to a museum whatever then that means if it's inside that five-year look back they're going to look at that as a gift and they're going to count that against you so um that's when we go to the, go to my outline here. So we talked about defining outlines. So this is where you need to look at when you're post-performance, you want to look at gifting early. You want to look at gifting before you get into that situation of having to have that five-year look back, um, if, if at all possible. Um, there's um, one of the things that we talked about in the master class was um, let's say you want a museum to have your instrument and they're interested in having your instrument and uh, but maybe you still need it for a few things you can um, assign the value you can gift it uh, you can go ahead and you know by doing that gift get that tax break but then you can also set that up where you can have lifetime use to that instrument and then it goes to the museum upon your death you've gifted it early you've set all that up you set it in motion you've already assigned the value everything's good you've already got the tax break on it your legacy has already been preserved and you still get to use the instrument until you pass away that's kind of the ultimate win-win um, same thing with uh, music catalogs uh, songwriting publishing masters any of that kind of thing <clears throat> if if you're comfortable and you know where it's going to go you may want to look at go ahead and, and, and gifting that early. Um, so, sorry, is everybody still there? I'm, I got a call about somebody wanting to sell me car insurance, I'm sure. Um, We're still here, Daniel. Okay, good deal. Um, one of the things I skipped over, sorry, um, defined values number two on my outlines here is established power of attorney. Um, that is something that you also want to do uh, in this whole gifting process and everything, if you have someone that you know that you can assign 
uh, medical and um, financial power of attorney to, that's always good because you don't know when you're going to get into a situation and you want to make sure that person is trustworthy, obviously, but you want to make sure that they understand copyright, publishing, what things are worth, um, how to get things uh, correctly evaluated for their worth, make sure they understand this values thing. Um, so that's something that you would want to make sure that you discuss with not just, well, you know, you're my power of attorney and I've got this body of work. Here you go. They need to understand songwriting, publishing, the, the, the split outs of percentages, um, who, whatever PRO you're with and how to get in touch with them, that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> talked about gifting early, um, what the gifts can be, money, physical property or intellectual property. Uh, want to gift before you need to, if at all possible. Um, and we talked about different things, where to gift, children, band partners, uh, co-writers, publishers, um, associations, museums. Um, I know Greg, that's part of our group, uh, brought up, you know, um, sometimes uh, I know there's several folks with the museums that say, gosh, we want all this stuff, but we don't have anywhere to store it all. We couldn't possibly take all your memorabilia ever presented in a way. So they may want to pick and choose a few things, but you say, well, gosh, I've got all this stuff. You know, there are archives. So it may be a situation where some things go to a museum, some things go to an archive, some things go somewhere else. Um, you know, there, there's, you just need to think about that and, and, and explore the possibilities. And that's part of what we're doing in the legacy work group is we will be giving you things as we go to help you identify um, here's these different areas that you can um, pr help preserve your legacy. And then as this thing gets fleshed out more and more and more, it's like, well, how do I, I don't know how to give anything to a museum other than find somebody at the museum and call them and go, hey, do you want my guitar? Well, we're gonna have those steps for you as we continue to flesh things out through this work group. And that's what's exciting is when we get through, it's gonna be, it's gonna take you from, from start to finish on this whole thing. Um, and it'll be an ever growing database of material too. Um, <clears throat> I wanna to touch base a little bit on how to gift because you know you are preserving your legacy and when you give it away, you wanna make sure it's gonna be there from now on. Um, be sure that um, the facility is gonna protect your property. Make sure that they have um, fire safety, humidification, different things like that. Um, be sure they want your gift um, and then, um, you know, educate um, anybody that you're going to be gifting to. I said that you're going to be giving away a body of work, songwriting, publishing, educate them on PROs, and royalties, how all that works before you gift it to them. Don't just give it to them and go, oh, by the way, here's how you, you know, make sure they understand it and have a vested interest in wanting to, to know that before you gift it away. Um, the other part of this I want to get into is um, you know, that that's kind of all why you're still here, you know, things you can can control while you're still here. <clears throat> um, the second half of this is once you're gone, um, not a subject any of us like to talk about or want to talk about, but it's coming, so we better. Um, so you know, make a will, hundred percent, definitely make a will. Don't don't leave anything up to chance when it comes to this. Um, but, um, clearly in your will, clearly define ownership and, uh, who gets what and be as detailed as you possibly can be. Um, you know, some folks want to just say, oh, well, so-and-so gets all this part, you know, so-and-so gets everything in the house and so-and-so gets everything in the barn and that's it. Well, that, that's great. But <clears throat> when you're talking about your legacy, it's important to define that. So be clearly defined on who gets what. Um, in the state of North Carolina, again, back to the legal thing, um, it's not legal advice. Um, make sure you get with an attorney. But for instance, a thing like in the state of North Carolina, um, your spouse has to get 50% of your assets. So you could say, well, I want to gift, you know, my entire catalog to this person, my, the songwriters that co-wrote with me, I want to give that back to them. Um, and I want to give my guitar to this museum and I want to give whatever over here. Well, if that 
causes the total value of what your spouse is getting to go below 50%, that's illegal in the state of North Carolina. They have to get 50% of all the assets. <clears throat> so what you can do in the state of North Carolina is one of the things you can do is those things can be put into a trust. So the asset value passes to the spouse, but it's put into a trust and the it's written into your spouse's will that, of what is to happen to the th items in that trust whenever they pass away. So it legally passes the asset value over and then when they pass away, your wishes are then followed through with. So it's just a different way to do it. It's kind of an extra step that you've got to do. But again, something we learned about with all of the stuff with Carolyn's mom and we didn't know that. So now everything's set up differently. We've even went back in to our wheels and set up things differently so that things pass as they should um, if one of us were to pass home before the other. Um, so, um, and the trust can, let's see, trust can be left and spouse's will, the person I just said that. Um, in North Carolina, the only thing that will negate that 50% thing is a prenup. Um, so I'm not going to get into the whole prenup thing. Some people are for them. Some people are against them, but if you do have a prenup in place that will, um, in the state of North Carolina, that will supersede the spouse getting the 50% of the assets. And, you know, it's like I said before that, you know, the, the, the first wife, the, everything that happens with the first wife makes, you know, the, the, the the good material for your, your album. And then the second wife gets you your first number one because it's more material and it goes on from there. <laughs> so as you're clearly defining everything, just make sure you're defining ownership. And it's also something to think about. Um, unfortunately, I just live in a world where we have to think about those kind of things, you know, about ownership and about, um, about all that. So, um, that's pretty much gets me to the end of my outline. I've kind of tried to zip through this as fast as I could. Um, we've already seen the worksheets. Um, the big takeaway before we get to questions, the big takeaway we want to get everybody to do this, you know, step number one, you have to list everything. 100% have to list everything. Um, nothing happens without that. So list everything, define value, and that can be a step that you can do now, you can do later. And then look at if you're going to gift, gift early and or make a will. So that's our three things that we want everybody to take away. And we've already seen the sheets, so we don't need to go through those. So I think we can open up for questions at this point. And do I have the ability to, who's doing that? So let me just jump in here real quick, Daniel, um, since you were offline at the very beginning, we actually did not look at the sheets. I told them that we had sheets for them, but we've not actually seen them. So, um, so let, me, yeah, should I open those, let me open those up. I'm going to uh, share my screen and start opening those up. And I'm all, I will also drop those into the chat um, so that people can download them as well. So while Lee is doing that, let me tell you real quick what we've done here. Um, so thank you, Daniel, for sharing all of that information. And I also dropped in uh, a basic outline that he was working off of into the chat for anyone who wants to print it out. I know sometimes it's hard to make all those notes. Um, but let me just show you real quick um, what we're doing. We're trying to just give you the tools to, to go ahead and get started. It's, it's easy to talk about these things, but, but getting started is another matter. So Lee is loading up some worksheets here in the chat. Um, so Lee, I guess just do them one at a time and I will explain them real quick as we go through. Um, this first worksheet is for copyrights. Now, one other thing too, the, it's you don't have to use all these worksheets. We've just done several of them and you pick the ones that work for you. Uh, we've tried to make them broad so that they work for artists, musicians, um, any kind of music professionals, whether you're graphic designer, photographer, whatever. Um, the, the hope is that these worksheets will, will work for you in some way to help you start collecting um, information on your, your uh, physical and intellectual property. So we all know that we need to um, 
we need to know what our copyrights are. Any co copywritten work that you own, whether it be a song, an arrangement, a photograph, book, slogan, whatever, here's your place to write it down. Um, you can three hole punch them at the top, stick them in a binder, and you can print as many of these sheets as you want. We just ask that you don't sell or distribute them. Um, official name of work, the publisher or publishers, any writers, composers, any creatives that are involved. Um, and who owns the copyright and percent of ownership and the location of the physical and digital files. And I'm even talking about the files you have in your file cabinet that refer to this copyright. You would be amazed at how you would need to refer back to that. And um, if you wanna take a stab at a value, um, if that's applicable, um, there's a space to do that. So Lee, you can take that one down and I will go over the next one real quick. Uh, one second here. How about agreements and contracts? Perfect. This one's a pretty simple one. Any agreements or contracts that you have entered into, um, this is the place to write that down, the ind individuals and entities involved, the location of your paperwork and any notes that you wanna make. All of this is very valuable and helpful information. Take that one down. Here's my favorite, okay. <laughs> Contract. Clothing and stage wear. Clothing yeah. and stage wear. You, you, you might not realize that the things that you wear in your performance do have value. And maybe while you're younger, you might not think that they do, but I can guarantee you that many years down the road, you'll look back and your fans will look back and say, oh, where was that pair of shoes that April danced in when she was at that show? Or, you know, where, where's that fiddle that Dan was playing on this album? Um, here's the place to to write that down. And I think the, the titles are pretty self-explanatory. Okay. How about non-digital assets? So we have uh, worksheets for both digital and non-digital non assets. When we're thinking of non-digital assets, we're specifically thinking about audio and video recordings, things you might have on two-inch reel, cassettes, um, things like that that have a physical form. So here's a place to write down the name of that asset, the type, what it is, and the format that it's on. Let's say the asset is an album that's been recorded in the studio and the format is a two inch reel. So you put that down, who is involved, um, dates, places, location of physical files. Um, another thing to remember, these um, lines may look a little small and you're thinking, I can't get all that information on that line. Just go down to the next one. This is your tool to use to help you get the information down. So just feel free to use as many lines as you need and print out as many copies as you want. Digital assets are gonna look pretty much the same. It's just gonna be a digital version of, of those items. And there it is. And there it is. <laughs> okay, how about instruments and gear? Instruments and gear, um, any kind of instrument or gear such as microphones, amplifiers, travel cases, those can be kind of expensive. Uh, mixing and recording equipment, here's where you can write all of that down. And the good news is, especially with this particular one, this is not just about making a record for those who come after you. If your stuff gets stolen out of a van, you've got it all right here. You've got your serial numbers, uh, your model, your year adding photos uh, or taking photos and, and writing down where those photos are stored is also a good idea. Okay. What else we got? We, publishing. Items of significance yeah. and publishing, I think, yeah. Let me shuffle some papers on my desk here. <laughs> publishing category, here we go. There. So this one is really important. And I can tell you when we were researching um, after my father passed away and we had to go through and figure out all of his publishing. And those who know, who know him know that he was pretty prolific and that was a very long task. Um, this would have been invaluable to have all this information. Um, title of work, the type of a work, whether it was a song or a writing of some sort, who is the publisher, what is your copyright registration number, copyright year, what percent do you own? This second to the last column, the year the assignment reverts, especially for older musicians or music that was um, published and, and, and performed maybe back in the 60s, those, cop, those publishing rights are starting to revert now. 
And there is an opportunity under copyright laws um, in a lot of situations to get your publishing back. So if you know what year it's coming, you know um, to start preparing for it. Because let me tell you, the companies, they don't want you getting that back. And they would like for you to miss their deadlines. So if you have these dates written down, you won't miss their deadlines. And then you can get your publishing back on, on your creative work. All right. Miscellaneous items of significance. And um, Greg Reich wanted to emphasize that in the academic and research world, um, there are a lot of items that people don't think are necessarily that important, but they can actually be considered primary source documents, which means when someone goes to research the life of an individual, there are documents like business papers, correspondence, set lists, um, things like that that are very important to researchers. So pretty much anything is up for grabs here. Um, anything of any value or significance that has dates on it, that has um, timelines on it, um, ticket stubs, you know, events, that type of thing. Um, and this could be for you, this could be for an artist that you collect their memorabilia. And it may not be your personal memorabilia, but it could be, you know, maybe you have some stuff of Bill Monroe's or Earl Scruggs that, um, that is of value. And this would be a good place to, to store those things. So, is that all of them? I think that's about everything. But I will say if anybody has any questions, uh, we're going to put all these sheets in the chat. If you're not able to get them out of the chat, just shoot me an email, um, katiehogue12 at gmail.com. Um, I will put that in the chat as well, and I will be happy to email them to you. And let me know if you have any questions, additions, thoughts, changes, any of that. So um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Does anybody have questions for Daniel or myself? Katie, can you put the um, the outline? Can you put that back in the chat? Can you drop it in the chat again? Not everybody got it. And yes, I'm going to do it right now. Thank you. So, in ter in terms of determining value, is it you know, for instance, an instrument? Are there a particular? I mean, a different instrument, different places might value it differently. So. How does one, is there a source or um, how does one place value on things? That's, that's interesting because that's literally the conversation that Katie and I were having this morning. <laughs> Very animated any, conversation. And, and, and I didn't and hear it. Go, it goes back to the, the, the three types of value. Sometimes you want to value something higher, like if you're trying to sell it. Um, sometimes you may want to value it lower for tax purposes or whatever else. Um, and, you know, what I was speaking to specifically in, in the end of it, when you're talking about a will, you're dealing with attorneys, things like that, their, their terminology consistently is real world value. And that's what will that item bring at that point in time on an average? So there, there's kind of three different things there, depending on what you need the value to do at that point in time. But if you're talking about um, a, a look back situation for, um, you know, later in life, if you, if you need long term care, you're looking at, at Medicare, you're looking at a look back or you're looking at estate planning, you're specifically looking at real world value to determine that. And that's what that item could be sold for, you know, whatever that, if it's an instrument that make that model, you know, have it appraised, that kind of thing. Um, because I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to put a value on a song catalog right. now. And if, because in, in five years, that's going to be different in 10 years, that's going to be different. Right. You know, um, the big thing we want everybody to take away from this is get it on step one get it all listed and know that those things do have value and in the future be it in an estate or in a look back situation they're going to look at the value of those so it's kind of an awareness thing as far as the value is concerned um that that's kind of our our big takeaway is we want to make sure that people spend the time using these worksheets and listing everything where we know, you know, you can go and know where it's, what you've got and where it's at. 
and then it's kind of like you worry you worry a little bit less about the value you know until you need to because that's going to change um the only caveat to that i'll throw out there is if it's a I, I hate to even bring it up, but the only way I can, if it's a tragedy, if somebody gets in a car wreck or something and passes away, if you have values already assigned to things, that's going to help everything. That's going to help everything pick up because that's going to be the most recent thing that you've assigned to it. So that would be a situation. That's the only thing I can think of that would be like the situation to tell everybody, hey, go ahead and assign this value. And of course, if you're going to be gifting and gifting early, that's when you would assign the value to it at the time of gifting. Gotcha. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? We actually, it's a small enough group where um, I'm happy to unmute um, anyone if they, I don't know, put something in the chat or just like wave your hand around or something. <laughs> you know, just to build uh, on, on um, you know, what you guys are discussing uh, is, and I'm Eric, I'm Katie's husband and have been, <laughs> Part of this wild ride with uh you know with with her legacy um or her family's legacy uh and, and that is um you know i think it is super smart to get um the details you know on on paper um so that you know when you do come to a point if you want to donate something or it does need to be appraised you know for one or another reasons uh you know for for instruments you know you can go to a um you know a, a licensed I don't even know if they're licensed, but but a qualified uh, appraiser like a George Gruen, you know, who can appraise uh, instruments, uh, and then there are appraisers for uh, catalogs, you know, as well. Uh, and, and typically, like if you're going to donate something, that and I won't. I was trying to look up the number. I think it is five thousand dollars. If it's more than if it's five thousand dollars or more, then you if you're going to donate it for a tax write off, you have to have an appraisal. Um, from a qualified appraiser, you know, there are, there are a host of folks out there. You can go to Country Music Hall of Fame or Blue Ghost Hall of Fame. They, they, they all know some appraisers who do that kind of work. Um, I think it's $5,000. I'll continue to look and if I find it, I'll put it in the chat. Very helpful, thank you. Any more questions for the speakers or comments or anything? It'd be a lot of work for someone. Mm -hmm. It's it's a lot of work, Annie. but I would I would say don't be intimidated by it. It's not like you have to print all this off and have it finished by this weekend. Think of it more like the New York Times crossword puzzle. You're going to take a first pass. And you're going to get the big stuff in and then you're going to go back and just slowly fill in the blanks. And it's just not going to be that big a deal. But when you're done, you're going to feel really good about it. April has it done already. <laughs> I'm sure she does. <laughs> Annie B. So Annie B has a question. It, yes. Because I'm the closest to having have all, all of this done out of everybody. Oh, Annie, you're going to live forever. I, and I have a my thing is, of course, a big non, I don't know how big, but the band's big, but nonprofit. But it, I had no idea what you were going to talk about today. I didn't, on legacy, I was thinking of it in a different way. Anyway, I think it's great. And it's something most people don't think about. And uh, I have already done the work but mine is like in totality all the property all the instruments the house all the fleet of vehicles all are in the will be in the hands of right. three people awesome too so jam pack hopefully will just carry on no no one particular person to you know because it's going to take more than one person to, to run it but anyway um to, to hear what you're talking about, I realize there's a, parts that have to be, although we're nowhere like worrying about copyrights and all that, but I have a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we're the repository for everybody's instruments, 18 bases. And, you know, things like that, and some of them probably fairly valuable. So I need to do that work. So I really appreciate, Daniel, what you've done on this, all of you. Something most people don't want to think about and don't know how to even begin. Mm -hmm. So thanks. That's my comment. It was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a really, really big shock to me whenever we started digging into all this, like, like I said, with Carolyn's mother, and I started immediately applying it over to our world and then with this legacy work group. It was a huge shock to me to start learning, especially the look back stuff, you know, that they look back on and the things that they'll assign value to. And, you know, it could be a situation where the things an artist has acquired, even if somebody gifted it to you, that now it's in your possession and it's yours and it's worth value. Mm -hmm. And they're going to look at that. And that was, I was like, wait a minute, an artist could work their whole life, have all these songs, have all this stuff. And their body of intellectual property could keep them from getting the medical the medical treatment that they need and it's it's if you've got it together and you've got the values and you've got it handled and you get an attorney there's ways to circumvent all that stuff without having to sell off everything that you've worked your whole life for but it, it's just an awareness thing if you're not aware of it then you don't know about it dan Hey, everybody. Um, I, I want to just kind of mention what I deal with quite a bit here at East Tennessee State University. Um, we deal with a lot of estate gifts and planned gifts. Um, and at certain institutions like ours, you can work with somebody from advancement to set these types of things up in advance. Um, we have stacks of of, of agreements with people who upon their passing, you know, will receive either scholarship funds or physical instruments that they want to be in the hands of, uh, of our program. And there can be parameters around them. You know, for example, we have some, we have three 1938 Martin guitars that uh, the, the donor wanted them to be used frequently. Um, we have other gifts where they're seen more as museum pieces, fewer of those, but, but more of, of the types of things. So you can, you can also establish through your attorney and through whatever institution, how those items will be preserved, how they'll be stored, how they'll be used into perpetuity. Dan, who wants to pay for the upkeep then is sometimes do the, does the donor put in a fund to make for maintenance or is it then upon your, your, your institution to upkeep them? A little of both. Um, once, once the university owns it, it's our responsibility, but we do have a few donors who, in addition to donating the instruments have set up endowments to where that you can use the interest off of the, of those endowments to pay for maintenance and upkeep yeah. and storage. Mm -hmm. okay. Dan, I would I would love to chat with you a little bit more in depth with that and include that in, in my part of this as, as a way of you know for people for giving and to set things up, kind of find out a little bit more, lead them down that path of how to do that correctly. Yeah. For example, it's usually right behind me here. Oh, there it is. It's back. Um, this base back here that you can see the neck of barely. That was Jimmy Stoneman's of the Stoneman family. That's that's the base he used throughout his entire career. It's a 1937K, and uh, it gets used almost every day of the week because that's what the family wanted for that instrument. So the students come in here, they get to learn about Jimmy Stoneman. They get, you know, it's, it's a conversation piece when people come to visit. Uh, it keeps Jimmy's legacy alive and and the base itself gets to be used all the time. That's awesome. 
All right, any final questions or final thoughts? We're drawing up to the hour. I do wanna thank uh, Katie and Daniel and the whole legacy group for the great work they're doing. And thanks Daniel again for presenting today and Katie. Um, I think this was a pretty successful uh, workshop and I think uh, looking forward to the ones that we have in the future. We're gonna be skipping the month of December, but we plan to have a another virtual workshop on January 11th. Um, and that's going to be something in the broadcasting uh, um, theme. Uh, not, we haven't exactly nailed that down yet. And then February 8th, we will have uh, Tom Gray uh, back with Ira Gitlin as a moderator talking about his stories. He just, again, a follow up from our master class. Uh, and Tom got, just got started when the hour was up. So definitely want to hear, from, hear more from Tom Gray. Um, thanks everyone else. Anything else? Otherwise, we'll sign off. Thanks everybody. Thank you.